We discovered his dad on the couch. His face was really pale. Four people have been murdered tonight. They're dead. You cannot lie to me. I will drag you down with this. What happened? You're in jail for the rest of your life. I'm looking in the eyes of Stone Cold Killer. There's no remorse. You are a Stone Cold Killer. A loving family, a comfortable home, a bright future. These are the things that 15-year-old Nicholas Browning had, but he lost it all on a fateful day when he returned home from a friend's to discover his home ransacked and the horrific sight of both his parents and his two younger brothers dead. But who could do such a thing? And how did the killer get caught? In this episode, we will unravel the shocking mystery of this case, from the clues that led the police to the suspect, to the motive behind the murders, to the trial and verdict that followed. This story is about hatred, greed, and cold-blooded murder. Make sure to watch this episode till the end for the shocking twist that will change everything you thought you knew about this average everyday family. We will reveal the identity of the heartless killer, including what he told friends shortly after his disgusting crime. This episode will haunt you, so brace yourself as you tune in for today's bite-sized true crime recap. Parents beware, Nicholas Browning, the deadly teen. Nicholas Browning was born into a seemingly picture-perfect family. His father, John W. Browning, was a successful attorney, and his mother, Tamara, was a devoted homemaker. He had two younger brothers, Benjamin and Gregory, and the family lived in the peaceful and affluent community of Cockeysville, Maryland. Nicholas was an honor student and Boy Scout who attended Delaney High School in nearby Timonium. He excelled in sports, playing varsity golf and lacrosse. He even completed a prayer garden at his church as a requirement for becoming an Eagle Scout. According to those who knew him, Nicholas appeared to be an all-around good kid, but no one knew what Nicholas was facing in his home and how his mental state was changing for the worse. Nick was just like any other teenager, active with a close-knit group of four friends. Taylor, Ryan, Alexander, and Nick were inseparable, often hanging out and partying together. A week before the tragedy, they had planned a series of sleepovers, first at Ryan's house and then at Nick's. It was supposed to be a normal teenager sleepover, just a typical night of movies and video games with little to no sleep included. As the boys settled in for the night, they had no clue of the horror that was about to unfold. On February 1st, 2008, the day before the incident, everything and everyone seemed normal. The friends were gearing up for their sleepover at Ryan's house, playing video games and watching TV shows as planned. However, as the night wore on, Nick had an idea. He would sneak out and borrow his father's car for a joyride. As midnight approached, he quietly ventured back to his house, but his parents were still awake. Hours later, he returned empty-handed back to his friends, claiming he had fallen asleep in the car while waiting for his parents to go to bed so he could grab the keys. The group thought nothing of it and continued with their plans for the day. After a trip to the mall, they headed to the destination of their next sleepover, Nick's house. Ryan's father dropped the friends off at Nick's house, but what they found there would haunt them forever. The door was unlocked, with Nick's Xbox and his mother's jewelry scattered outside. Inside, the house was ransacked. Everything pointed to a burglary. But as soon as Nick reached the living room, he was met with the grisly sight of his father lying dead on the couch. He raced upstairs to check on his mother and his brothers, but the worst had occurred. All of them were dead, shot mercilessly in the head. Nick ran outside and frantically called 911. When the authorities arrived, they pronounced the entire family dead. However, something didn't add up. The teenagers' stories didn't match, and valuable items had appeared in the trash. If this was a robbery gone wrong, why would the thief leave without taking the expensive jewelry? As well, there were no signs of struggle. It seemed as though the killer had murdered Nick's family before ransacking the house. The investigators took the four friends to the police station to try and piece together what had happened. But when the truth finally emerged, they were left reeling in shock. Four teenage boys, Nicholas Browning, Taylor Tuxbury, Ryan Fingles, and Alexander Smith were hauled into the police station for a grueling interrogation. Ryan was the first to spill the beans about their sleepover at his place, but he also dropped a bombshell. Nick had snuck out in the middle of the night to fetch his car and never came back with it. He also remembered how when Alex called him to ask where he was, Nick said he had dozed off in the car, but then returned to Ryan's house without it. Taylor was next in the hot seat. He claimed that he had slept through most of the night and woke up to find his buddy snoring. The detective pressed him on Nick's whereabouts, and Taylor cracked. He admitted that Nick was gone when he checked the time at 1.30 a.m. When Nick was being interrogated, he tried to stick to his story of going back to his house to get his car keys, falling asleep in the car, and then coming back empty-handed. But he was eerily calm throughout the questioning. 
he didn't seem to care that his family had been brutally murdered. This almost psychopath-like behavior was alarming, but not enough for the detectives to cast aspersions on Nick, yet. Alex was the last one to face the detective. He initially covered for Nick, saying that he never left Ryan's house, but when the detective exposed his lie, revealing that all of his friends had already told him about Nick's venture back to his home, Alex caved in and changed his story. The detective noticed something odd as he wrapped up this round of questioning. Nick was smiling at some of the detective's jokes. How could he be so cheerful when his family was gone? What kind of monster was he? The detective dug deeper into Nick's home life, and Taylor spilled the beans that Nick had a drinking problem and often was in trouble with his parents. Another boy revealed that Nick had called his brother to open the garage door for him, to which Nick eventually confessed. Alex also remembered Nick ranting about his mother's alcoholism, his annoying brothers, and his father's tyranny. He said Nick called his dad Hitler because he was so strict and controlling. The detective knew that something was off about Nick. He let the other three boys go and focused all his attention on Nick. Pulling the age-old tactic of pressuring a suspect into confessing, the detective told Nick that he had solid evidence that Nick was lying and that he was involved in the horrific crime scene at his house. But it was a bluff. All they had found was the key to Nick's father's gun safe next to Nick's bed. Nick denied everything at first, but his voice was weak and shaky, not strong and defiant like an innocent person's. The detectives kept hammering him with different scenarios and showed him a picture of his family. They wanted him to crack and confess, but Nick didn't budge. He knew they had nothing on him except for the key. He even fell asleep while handcuffed to the table, showing no signs of anxiety or remorse. The detectives came back after 40 minutes and uncuffed him. They tried again to get him to talk, but Nick wasn't giving in. He knew he had them beaten. The detectives changed their strategy, and instead of asking whether he did it, they turned to ask him why he did it, what drove him to kill his own flesh and blood. After five hours and multiple rounds of questioning, 15-year-old Nick finally started to break down. He began his confession by telling about his involvement with the Boy Scouts and a camp meeting he had attended. At camp, he had not been on his best behavior, and when his father found out, he had become upset and abused Nick physically and mentally. On the night of the incident, Nick had come home to find his father sleeping in the living room with one of his firearms lying out. Impulsively, Nick grabbed the weapon and killed his father by shooting him in the head. He then proceeded to shoot and kill his sleeping mother and 14 and 11-year-old brothers, too. During Nick's confession, the detective leaned in and paid rapt attention as he spoke. For the first time since the case began, Nick expressed some real emotions and sniffled and cried. After this, he told them the location of the firearm which he had thrown out. The detective now had what he was looking for, but he still needed to tie up some ends and asked Nick to provide some exact information about the actual evil act. Nick gave him a horrifically grim account of how he methodically murdered his entire family. He told him about moving the Xbox and other things to make it look like a burglary. The detective appeared calm. He got some of his colleagues to look for the firearm and told Nick about his grandfather who would be coming around. With a confession in place, the detective brought Nick the clothing he would wear for decades to come, a prisoner's jumpsuit. Following a brief trial, Nicholas Browning pleaded guilty in January 2009 to four counts of first-degree murder for killing his parents and two younger brothers in 2008. He was sentenced to four life sentences, but could be eligible for parole after 23 years. During the trial, Browning chillingly confessed to shooting his family members with his father's gun while they were asleep and how he spent two nights at a friend's house before telling anyone. He claimed he did it because of abuse, but there was no denying the fact that the murders were committed in cold blood. A defense psychiatrist testified that Nick's parents physically and verbally abused him and that he suffered from a dissociative disorder and was in a trance-like state during the shootings. The prosecution's state psychiatrists, however, found differently, saying that he had no diagnosable mental illness. Ultimately, the jury was also not convinced that Nick's actions were due to his mental illness and therefore showed no compassion for this stone-cold mass killer. The nation was left reeling at the news of the brutal, cold-blooded murder of the Browning family, a typical all-American family. However, the shocking twist when it was revealed that their own 15-year-old son Nick was the perpetrator horrified parents everywhere. Was it a moment of madness or a cold, calculated act? Prosecutor Robin Coffin didn't hold back, declaring that Nick Browning, the deadly teen, should never see the light of day again. Finally, in a bizarre turn of events, Nick is reportedly seeking a pen pal to ease his lonely existence behind bars. Has he found someone to share his thoughts with? Only time will tell. But one thing is certain. Any potential pen pal won't be meeting Nick Browning face to face anytime soon.